All right, guys, welcome back to science. We are in lesson 2.7, uh, wrapping up chapter two of our evolutionary history unit. Um, we are going to be continuing throughout uh, this learning about evolutionary history today and then moving into chapter three, which only has a few lessons. So I always get kind of excited towards the end of the unit because everything's really gonna start to come together around our mystery fossil. Uh, hopefully you brought yourself and got yourself together today with a piece of paper and a pencil to jot down some of your thinking um, and to answer the questions as we go throughout this unit. If you haven't grabbed a piece of paper and a pencil to get started, um, now's a great time to pause the video before we jump into our warm up on this slide and get started. So go ahead and grab those things if you need. And we're gonna go ahead and start our warm up for those of you who are ready with your paper and your pencil. In our warm up, we're gonna be looking at a Komodo dragon and a red tailed boa. Komodo dragons are a lizard species and red tailed boas are a snake species. Both are reptiles. They share a common ancestor population that lived about 250 million years ago but they have been separated into different environments with different food sources for millions of years. Komodo dragons and red-tailed boas have some shared structures. They also have some differences though in their structures. So that was the reading. Please feel free to rewind the video if you need to go back and use some of that information to help you answer your warm-up question. Uh, in the warm-up question, I wanted you to be able to see those two species and to see this awesome chart that help, really helps us to break down, like we've broken down in some t-charts in the previous videos, um, the shared structures that they have, and then what are some of the different structures that these two species have. So go ahead and answer this question. Remember to rewind if you need to. But the question is asking, explain why the Komodo dragon and the red-tailed boa have some similar structures and some different structures. That's a two-part question, so be a little bit careful as you are answering it. Not only should you be explaining why there's those similarities, but you also need to be describing where those differences. Something I'm gonna really push you and continue to ask you to do is to make sure that you are including as much detail and really demonstrating the best thinking as you can uh, as you're working on this video independently. So go ahead and pause the video now and take some time to engage in that deep thinking. Moving on from our warm up, we are going to be getting into one of my favorite simulations uh, that Amplify puts out. Um, some of you may have engaged in the simulation in a different unit, in the natural selection unit. Um, and today we're gonna to be engaging in that same simulation to think about some of our concepts around evolutionary history. So if you have the simulation and you have that access at home, remember, I wanna push you to try and complete this part independently. Now, usually I have been putting your part first if you're going off and working on it independently and you'll notice that the background of your screen is blue. Today, the people who I'm gonna be working with and we're gonna be working through the simulation together, their slides are gonna be first. So if you have access to the simulation and you wanna uh, pull that up in lesson 2.7, go ahead and do that at home and then just fast forward this video until you see the blue slides. Um, once those slides turn to a blue background, that's gonna be a spot where you can work through at your own pace, answer the questions at your own pace and push yourself as uh, a learner to engage in that learning independently. For the rest of us, we're gonna start right now thinking through this simulation together. And in fact, just like it talked about the Komodo dragon and the boa having different environments, we're going to be looking at different environments uh, and putting our australopes into different environments. Uh, I love these guys. You can start to kind of see that they have some different structures, uh, just like any other animal that we are talking about um, previously in the unit, but these are in a model. So uh, australopes are not real animals, but they're gonna help us to understand some of the things that we need to know. 
Australopes love to eat these plants called thorn palms. And even though thorn palms are not uh, an animal, plants have structures as well. So when we are changing their environment today, the structures that we're gonna be altering it within the thorn palm is that sometimes thorn palms grow up to be different heights. Sometimes thorn palms have different thorn lengths, which is a little bit tricky, I think, to see in this picture, but you're gonna to start to notice that there are thorns coming out of the top of that tree. So today, uh, we're gonna to be starting by using an environment that has taller thorn palms than your average thorn palm. And then we're gonna look at an environment that has longer thorns on the top of that plant. We're gonna be changing the environment and specifically we're changing the, the thorn palms in the environment to see what impact is that going to have on the evolution of the Australopes. So take a second right now to predict kind of what you think is going to happen. You can pause the video and kind of read through these and think about in, um, um, environment A, what's gonna happen for our part one, and then in part two, what's gonna happen in our environment B. If you're still working on those predictions, that is totally fine, um, but you can also use this to help you think through your prediction. Um, if you're still writing that out, that is totally okay. Wanted to give you a little bit of a visual of what these two different environments are gonna look like. This environment over here has some taller thorn palms, and this environment, environment B, has thorn palms with larger thorns. It's a little bit easier to see the thorn uh, the, the size of the thorns here changing, but if you do look closely over here, you can see we've got some taller thorn palms and we've got some thorn palms that are a little bit shorter. One thing that is important to note is that just like in the real world, uh, most plants in the real world do not grow exactly the same. Uh, in this model, it does a really good job of showing us that variation of different species out there in the world. So. Uh, finish up your predictions and then what we're going to do is we're going to open up that video starting with uh, Sorry, open up our simulation and we're going to take a look at our taller thorn palms and see how that's going to affect the Australopes uh, to get started. So we'll see in that sim in just a few moments if you haven't made your prediction yet Pause the video and do that now All right, here we are back in uh, the simulation and if you are in the simulation or if you do have access, you may wanna even follow along at home. That's kind of that third option that we didn't discuss earlier. But if you are following along, I'm gonna to need to click in here and click on the exploring species change mode. That's gonna set up the model in a way that is going to best support me in understanding the evolutionary aspects that this model can show, uh, which should be super helpful. So let me just make my screen a little bit bigger here for you so you can see, there we go. Um, so I'm gonna zoom in and you can see here we've got our Australopes and we have our thorn palms. I'm gonna click on the thorn palms and for environment A, we're gonna set that height to a height of a level seven. And I'm gonna set my variation to a medium level variation. Then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go up here and I'm gonna click run. And what's going to start to happen is our thorn palms are going to be going around, they're going to be eating, um, they're going to be reproducing and creating more new Australopes as they are going around in the sim. You're going to notice that the generation up here is changing. We are now on generation three. For this, I don't think I mentioned it earlier, we're going to go to generation 50. So you're going to want to, if you're doing this at home, click here, otherwise it's gonna take a long time to go 50 generations. Not as much time as it would in real evolutionary history, of course, but it's gonna take a while. You're gonna notice that that generation time is going to speed up, and we will come back in and analyze some of our data here in a moment when that gets up to that 50 generation mark. All right, so we're back and I uh, was a little bit slow on the pausing. So we actually ended up going 51 generations, which is okay. Um, I'm gonna click into our analyze tab, 
which is really, really helpful because we're going to start to see some of those changes in our neck length over time. So there's this really cool scroll bar that you can go back in time, back all the way to generation number one, see that most of our Australopes had a neck length of five, which means it was a medium neck length. Over time, as I pull this, as the generations were moving on, we're going to notice that there were some changes and that our neck length moved to be closer uh, to having more Australopes at that maximum neck length. So that's going to be helping us as we think about how changes to the environment, specifically changes in the resource that that Australope eats, the thorn palm, how that affects its structure of the Australope's neck. All right, so we're back into our slideshow to answer a follow-up question. Uh, feel free, of course, to rewind if you need to see that data again. But part one, I'm gonna ask you to think about after allowing the Australopes to breed for 50 generations, what ended up being the most common neck size? So go ahead, pause the video now, answer that question, and then we're gonna be moving on to part two once you get done. All right. Part two of this simulation that we're gonna be doing together is that we're gonna be changing our thorn size. Last time we changed uh, the height of our thorn palm to seven and we set variation to medium. Now we're gonna jump back into that simulation. We're gonna do the exact same thing except we're gonna be adapting the thorn size. So let's go ahead and click our way back to that simulation and then we can run it for 50 generations to see what we end up with all right here we are back into our simulation and we're going to be changing uh, not the height this time but we're going to actually be changing the thorn size so let's go ahead we'll move thorn size to a size of seven and then what we're gonna be doing is moving our variation up to the medium size. I'm gonna again go ahead and hit run. And as this starts to go, remember we wanna speed it up and then we'll check in once we hit that 50 generation mark here in a little bit. Okay. This time I got it paused right on 50 generations, so I didn't let it go one too many. So let's go and take a look at what happened to our Australopes. And now what you're going to start to notice is that um, if we were looking at that neck length, there's a little bit of a change in our neck length. But for the most part, our neck length data is still around kind of that five to six range. But if we look at a different structure, specifically if we look at the jaw strength, we're going to go back in time to when all the jaws has a jaw strength of five. Um, and then over time, there's those crazy thorns that we added and we made there be a high level of thorns on our thorn palms. You're going to notice here I'm at generation 40, almost all the way there, generation 50, there were some changes uh, that you might see. Just wanna challenge you, last time we talked about what were some of the changes that we saw. And we're gonna answer that question again here in a second, but I want you to see, maybe you can even include some numbers and some data from this chart, because as we write as scientists, it's always important that we're trying to include some of the data that we're getting, whether that's from a real life lab or a simulation like this, it really is going to make your writing strong um, and it's going to help to show your point about the changes that were taking place for this australope in their evolution uh, as the, their environment was changing. So when we were in the sim, I just got done talking about that this was the question we were going to answer again. Hopefully you pulled a number or two that would be helpful for you in your answer. Um, but we're going to be answering the same question pretty much as we did with environment A. But now I want you to think about after allowing those Australopes to breed for 50 generations, what was the most common jaw strength? So take a second to go ahead and pause the video now, just like you answered earlier, and answer that question. All right, 
So what we ended up seeing, and we've been taking a look at these evolutionary trees, is that we saw that we once had that common ancestor population. It had a jaw strength level of five, and it had a neck length level of five. And as we change that environment, those australopes ended up becoming adapted and evolved into completely different looking species. Okay, so that is when we have that evolution taking place. Those descendant species are now so different that they could no longer breed, but they're able to survive in their new environments. So we're going to continue to just wrap up that simulation. I know that was a lot, but we are moving uh, into the final few parts of this lesson. So stay strong. We're almost there. Uh, so. The last questions I want you to think about are a little bit more holistic over those whole labs. You just answered two questions at the end of each part. Now I want you to pause and think about these two questions. We just sort of went over this and that last image is gonna be something that will help you. So the first question you wanna answer is, according to your results, how are the results different between part one and part two? And what was it that caused that process? Question two says, explain why even different environments, the two species have many similarities. Hopefully you're starting to notice that this is a similar question to what you thought of in your warm up, and hopefully those ideas of similarities and differences and how the environment's impacting that is starting to come together for you. So go ahead and answer these two questions and that will be our wrap up for the simulation before we move into our next activity for today. If you need a little bit of extra help, there is some helpful vocabulary down here. And if you were somebody who needed to do that simulation independently, you might have thought I almost forgot about you. I apologize. I'm going to click through these slides so that you can pause and just work through at your own pace if you wanted to, if you were somebody that fast forwarded to see these blue slides. <laughs> 